The Mortal Kombat franchise features one of the most dense and elaborate timelines in video game history. The epic fighting game series unfurls its melodramatic narrative across 13 games, with a timeline that reboots itself not once, but twice. So how exactly does it all tie together? Well, as it's quite a mad, audacious timeline, it's quite messy. Hence why I'm going to use this handy chalkboard to map it out. And with Mortal Kombat 1 further expanding, or resetting the timeline, what better time to dive back into the carnage, that's with a K of course, of this iconic fighting game franchise. Hey, my name's Adam, and this is the complete Mortal Kombat timeline fully explained. Okay, so the Mortal Kombat timeline kicks off with, well, centuries worth of crucial backstory. You see, the fictional universe of MK is made up of several realms that are created and overseen by a group of celestial beings known as the Elder Gods. While we'll visit plenty of these realms across this timeline, the majority of the chronology is set across Earthrealm, which is basically akin to our good blue planet, Outworld, a war-torn place lorded over by the villainous Emperor Shao Kahn, the Netherrealm, which is basically the MK rendition of Hell, the realms of Chaos and Order, which sort of speak for themselves, and finally Adania, which is a land of beauty and prosperity. Anyway, as this is a fighting game, these realms are constantly at war with each other, and as a result, the Elder Gods have decreed that any realm which wants to conquer another can do so via a long, complex and elaborate series of 10 consecutive tournaments, and this divine red tape is known as the titular Mortal Kombat. All of which brings me around to introducing a few of the franchise's key players, whose actions effectively kickstart the events of the original timeline. First there's Shinnok, a former Elder God who set his sights on conquering Earthrealm, and for his troubles comes up against its anointed protector, the God of Thunder, Raiden. Raiden beats seven shades of hell out of the one-time God and strips him of his power before exiling him to the hellscapes of the Netherrealm. Naturally, Shinnok doesn't just sit around licking his wounds, he builds his team for revenge, taking control of the realm with the help of his lieutenant, Quan Chi. But with one bad egg out of the picture, another seeks to take his place, and this terrible lad is known as Shao Kahn. Shao Kahn picks up where Shinnok left off and is far more successful in his invasion of Earthrealm, to the point where he and his warriors have successfully knocked off 9 out of the 10 tournaments required for power. And with the 10th tournament imminently taking place, Earthrealm's protector Raiden assembles a team of warriors to make a last stand for the planet, all of which leads us right into the very first game in the franchise, but it's likely not what you'd expect. Yep, this timeline kicks off in earnest with perhaps one of the worst games in the entire franchise. Yep, the turgid spin-off Special Forces. I'll keep this one mercifully brief, as aside from being the first chronological appearance of US Army Major Jax Briggs, the story is, you could say, quite slight. In a nutshell, Special Forces finds Jax hunting down a bad lad by the name of Kano, who happens to be the crime lord of the Black Dragon Empire. Kano slaughters a whole load of Special Forces troops during a prison raid before escaping to the realm of Outworld. With Jax hot in pursuit, Kano discovers a mythical MacGuffin that can transport the user between realms, but Jax beats him to the punch and nabs the artifact for himself, which allows him to transport them both back to Earthrealm where he dumps Kano in a nice cosy jail cell. But wait, there is another spin-off that we need to get through before we can get to the prospect of that mouth-watering 10th Mortal Kombat tournament. And sadly, this is another that could contend for the worst game in the franchise. Mortal Kombat mythology's Sub-Zero, like Special Forces, sidesteps away from the fighting genre into action-adventure, and gives some meaningful backstory to two of the franchise's most iconic fighters. One obviously is Sub-Zero, and the other is his rival Scorpion. The pair first come face to face when the former is hired by Shinnok's old mate Quan Chi to steal an old map guarded from a Shaolin temple. Only unbeknownst to Sub-Zero, Scorpion has also been hired to recover the map, and the pair fight to the death to get it, resulting in Sub-Zero offing Scorpion. Naturally, a map leads to treasure, and that's exactly where Sub-Zero heads next. X does mark the spot, and Sub-Zero discovers a power-granting amulet that supposedly belonged to the disgraced god Shinnok. Quan Chi swoops in at the last second though and takes the amulet for himself, before bouncing back to his home in the Netherrealm. Enter Earth's protector Raiden, who's pretty pissed at Sub-Zero for handing something so powerful to a certified Rongan and sends him on a mission to retrieve the amulet. 
Long story short, Sub-Zero travels to the Netherrealm, encounters and defeats his freshly deceased rival Scorpion, who's now an undead shadow of his former self, and tracks the amulet to Quan Chi's hellish fortress. There, he defeats Quan Chi before encountering the big bad lad that is Shinnok, who he escapes from in order to deliver the amulet back to Raiden. All of this eventually leads to that 10th and final Mortal Kombat tournament though, a tournament that Sub-Zero is cordially invited to. Okay, we're finally at the very first Mortal Kombat and the tournament to decide the fate of Earthrealm. But first, a little more backstory. You see, it turns out that there are a few more wrong'uns knocking about that feed into Shao Kahn's attempts to conquer Earthrealm. Firstly, there's Shao Kahn's right-hand man, the evil sorcerer Shang Tsung, who's actually hosting the tournament and stacking the odds firmly in the favour of an outworld victory. And secondly, there's his prized fighter Goro, who's a four-armed warrior behemoth that has reigned supreme as the champion of the previous nine Mortal Kombat tournaments, dating back for the last 500 years. So you can sort of see the uphill battle faced by Raiden and his team of Earthrealm fighters. Chief among Raiden's team is the Shaolin monk Liu Kang, but the roster also includes narcissistic movie star Johnny Cage, Special Forces agent Sonya Blade, criminal mastermind Kano, and of course Sub-Zero and the Undead Scorpion. While you can choose any of the fighters to date Goro and Shang Tsung down a peg, canonically it's Liu Kang who wins the tournament, and is crowned as the new Mortal Kombat Grand Champion. And with an Earthrealm success in the final tournament, Outworld's takeover threat is extinguished, which feels a little unfair seeing as they won the first nine tournaments, but who am I to argue with the Elder Gods? Right, after a particularly chastening defeat in the 10th Mortal Kombat tourney on Earthrealm, Shang Tsung heads back to his home in Outworld with his tail between his legs. His master, the Emperor Shao Kahn, is naturally not too happy, and is pretty much ready to execute his lackluster lackey. But Shang Tsung manages to convince him to spare his life by suggesting that they organise another tournament on Outworld, which will give them a distinct home field advantage. Either way, Raiden and his band of Earthrealm warriors agree to the rematch and make their way to the home of Shao Kahn. Again, the tournament can be played with any one of a roster of 12 playable characters, which all lead to non-canonical endings, as the one true ending of Mortal Kombat 2 is once again the victory of Earthrealm poster boy Liu Kang. But Mortal Kombat 2's story is notable for a couple more reasons as well. Firstly, it gives us canonical confirmation that the original Sub-Zero, whose real name is Bai Han, was killed by the undead Assassin Scorpion in the previous Mortal Kombat tournament. While this initially provides some mystery as to how Sub-Zero is still knocking about in Mortal Kombat 2, this is answered by the fact that Bai Han's younger brother, Kwai Liang, has assumed his sibling's alter ego of Sub-Zero. The original Sub-Zero descends into the Nether Realm where he's stripped of his humanity and eventually becomes the Shadow Wraith Noob Cybot, but I'm getting way ahead of myself there. Anyway, secondly it introduces Liu Kang's best mate Kung Lao into the franchise for the first time, a character that gets a good deal more time in the limelight in our next game on the timeline. Yep, we're back in spin-off territory again for the events of Mortal Kombat Shaolin Monks, which is a rerun of sorts of the events of Mortal Kombat 2, but from the perspective of the titular Shaolin Monks Liu Kang and Kung Lao. Like Special Forces and Mythology's Sub-Zero before it, Shaolin Monks takes a sidestep into the action-adventure genre, repurposing the ending of MK1 and the central narrative of MK2 into a more traditional beat-em-up. And seeing as I've just regaled the story of both of those games, we'll leave it at that. Okay, it's time for Mortal Kombat 3, which sees Shao Kahn enact a loophole in the whole Mortal Kombat red tape tournament rubbish, and invade Earthrealm through different means. Seeking to put an end to his losing streak, Shao Kahn instead opts to kickstart a plan supposedly 10,000 years in the making. This plan is to reincarnate his former young love, Queen Sindel, within the boundaries of Earthrealm, which will allow him to cross between the dimensions to reclaim his queen and conquer Earthrealm via a sneaky loophole. He does exactly that, and as soon as he takes over his queen and his new realm, billions of Earthrealm people all suddenly lose their souls. Luckily, Raiden is able to protect a few Earthrealm warriors, otherwise MK3 would be a pretty short game, and there would be no one to kick the living crap out of each other. 
Naturally, there are a whole load of stories all happening at once, depending on which fighter you choose to tackle the main campaign with, but there are three key story beats for my money. Firstly, we catch back up with Liu Kang, who is naturally a main target for Shao Kahn once he realises that a handful of Earthrealm warriors are still alive. Liu Kang joins forces with Kung Lao, and the pair lead the rebellion against the invading forces, which eventually leads to Kung Lao's supposed death when he succumbs to his battle injuries. Kung Lao's fate fuels Liu Kang's fury at Shao Kahn, who he eventually defeats before shacking up with the Adanian royal, Princess Katana, who herself has a long and complex family history with the Khan. Long story short, she's the daughter of Sindel, who, shock horror, it turns out is not Shao Kahn's former queen, but the wife of a lad named Jared. Anyway, then there's the clan of assassins known as the Lin Kuei, who have actually been around since the beginning and claim Sub-Zero in their ranks and they take on a much more prominent role in MK3. Sick of having to deal with actual humans, the Lin Kuei decide to turn four of their prime assassins into soulless robots, and the unlucky four are Cyrax, Sector, Smoke, and our old mate Sub-Zero. Smoke and Sub-Zero opt out, you know, for obvious reasons, but Smoke is hunted down and turned into a robot regardless. Sub-Zero is also hounded, but he's able to evade his former clan, and as a result, he joins the rebellion against Shao Kahn. Lastly, there's the special forces duo of Jax and Sonya, who in the wake of Shao Kahn's defeat set up the Outer World Investigation Agency, or OIA, which becomes an organisation dedicated to thwarting potential invasions from other realms. Naturally, there are a handful of other subplots knocking about in MK3, but those are the key ones to the overarching timeline. Right, on to Pastures New. Okay, step aside Shao Kahn, it's time for the big bad elder god named Shinnok to return to the fore as the primary antagonist in the MK universe, a feat which he achieves with the help of Quan Chi during the events of Mortal Kombat 4. Last seen in the Sub-Zero spin-off game, Shinnok returns to wage war on the elder gods who banished him, including Earthrealm saviour Raiden. He's aided in this vengeful quest by an Adanian traitor known as Tanya, who helps him invade her homeworld before supporting Shinnok on his warpath against the elder gods. Once again, Raiden enlists a whole host of warriors, old and new, to take the battle to Shinnok. You have exactly one guess as to who eventually defeats Shinnok. Yep, it's perennial good egg Liu Kang once again. Meanwhile, to continue some of the other subplots that we've been tracking, Sub-Zero is also in on the action. Tricked by Quan Chi into believing Scorpion killed his whole family, he tracks down and fights his nemesis once again. While Sonya continues on the Special Forces' long vendetta against the Black Dragon Crime Syndicate, and she tracks down another of its members, a lad named Jarek, who's basically Kano 2.0, before she's nearly killed by the criminal. Fortunately, her teammate Jax is able to step in and drop Jarek off a cliff to his supposed death. Yeah, there are a lot of supposed deaths in these fighting games, because these characters just keep coming back. Anyway, upon returning home, Jax and Sonya discover Lin Kuei cyborg assassin Cyrax malfunctioning in a desert. They revive the mad robot, restore his lost humanity, and recruit him into the OIA. Oh, and surprise, Kung Lao isn't dead. He merely faked his death to live a life that was respectful to his ancestors. But this turns to disrespect when he decides to rejoin the fight and take up arms against Shinnok. And finally, in the wake of Shinnok's defeat, Raiden is granted full Elder God status, and as a result he retires from his position as the protector of Earthrealm, handing over the role to his brother, the God of Wind, Fujin. But don't you worry, this is not the last we'll see of the God of Thunder, oh no. Next up on the timeline, we are venturing away from numbered sequels for the tag team event of the season, the Deadly Alliance. The titular Deadly Alliance is made up of the evil sorcerers Quan Chi and Shang Tsung, both of whom have played second fiddle to the respective big bads of Shinnok and Shao Kahn. Sick of being second best, they decide to team up when Quan Chi discovers an ancient tomb containing the mummified remains of the first Emperor of Outworld, the Dragon King, and his massive army. But before they can take over the known universe, they set out to dispose of the two people that might stand in their way, Shao Kahn and Liu Kang. After faking allegiance to the former, the pair murder him in cold blood before travelling to Earthrealm to drop in on Liu Kang. And Shang Tsung finally gets his revenge on Mortal Kombat's mainstay when he kills the franchise's core good guy once and for all. Yet we are five mainline games in and the ever-present Liu Kang is dead and gone. He's not even playable in the game, which is a really ballsy move by the developers if you ask me. Anyway, the sorcerers dine out on Liu Kang's soul and hightail it back to Outworld to kickstart their plan to resurrect the Dragon King and his army. 
Quan Chi uses the Amulet of Shinnok, remember that from all the way back in Mythology Sub-Zero, to open up a portal to the heavens known as the Sol Nado, which brings in souls for the Dragon King's army by the bucket load. Meanwhile, Earthrealm's warriors are once again being marshalled by Raiden, even if he can't himself intervene due to his status as an Elder God. They travel to Outworld en masse, but canonically speaking, as is later confirmed in the intro sequence of the next game, they all fail in their attempts to stop the Deadly Alliance, and Jack, Sonya, Kung Lao and Katana are all killed in the fight. This all leads to Raiden telling the other Elder Gods to hold his beer as he renounces his status as a god and rejoins the fight to take out the Deadly Alliance himself, which leads straight into the intro of... Okay, so we're right back into the thick of the action at the beginning of Mortal Kombat Deception, Raiden versus the Deadly Alliance, and I'm afraid it's not good news for Raiden. The Thunder God is finally defeated and battled by the Sorcerers, but while he's out for the count, the Deadly Alliance turn on themselves in a bid to claim the power of controlling the Dragon King's army. Quan Chi eventually emerges victorious, but blinded by the heat of the battle, he doesn't realise that the Dragon King himself, Onaga, the ancient ruler of Outworld, has been resurrected alongside his army. With the help of the revived duo of Raiden and Shang Tsung, Quan Chi attempts to fight off the Dragon King, but Onaga is totally out of their league on the battlefield. In a last ditch effort to stop Onaga, Raiden releases his godly essence, which basically amounts to a small nuclear bomb, which blows everything up killing Quan Chi and Shang Tsung in the process, but leaving nary a scratch on the Dragon King. That's certainly not the end of Raiden though, his godly essence regathers on Earthrealm and the God of Thunder effectively returns as a vengeful pissed off god. His mood is not helped by the introduction of Deception's lead protagonist, a lad called Shu Jinko, a next generation Liu Kang of sorts if creator Ed Boon's words are anything to go by. You see, Shujinko is something of a gullible fool, and it's Onaga's deception of him that provides the context for the game's title. Onaga, disguised as an emissary for the Elder Gods named Damashi, orders Shujinko to search high and low for six mystical kamidogu, or god tools, to help him further cement his power. His ultimate endgame? Nothing short of the destruction of all the realms in the known universe. When Shujinko finds out about this deception, he's naturally pretty pissed, and he swears revenge on the Dragon King. Luckily for Shujinku, Anaga has taught him the power to mimic other fighting styles, a misguided move that ultimately leads to his downfall. But back to Raiden, who's so angry about Shujinku's foolish behaviour that he digs up Liu Kang's half-rotten corpse and revives him as, well, a zombified husk of a monk. And so Liu Kang re-enters the fray, sort of, and goes on something of a murderous rampage totally unbefitting of a Shaolin monk. Anyway, the rest of Mortal Kombat Deception is a big old battle for supremacy between the surviving fighters from Deadly Alliance and Onaga and his band of supporters. Onaga has also drafted the Realm of Adania into his ranks as well, with the help of Adanian Princess Melina, who's also in on the Deception game as she's running about pretending to be Princess Katana. Oh, and on top of all of this, Onaga uses his power to resurrect the dead to revive all of the previously deceased combatants to fight as undead warriors for him. So cue zombie versions of Sonya, Kung Lao, Katana, and Jax, etc, etc. Anyway, back to Liu Kang and not the zombie version that I mentioned earlier. You see, Liu Kang's soul has lived on and has latched itself to a fighter known as Ermac, who's basically a human conduit for souls anyway, and this unlikely duo helped to free the imprisoned souls of Anaga's undead army. Long story short though, this all leads inevitably to Anaga's defeat, at the hands of all people, Shujinku. Which I suppose brings his story full circle. Shujinko uses his aforementioned ability to mimic other fighters' powers to take revenge on Anaga and he finally defeats the Dragon King in battle. Okay, here we are, the big climactic ending of the original Mortal Kombat timeline. Strap yourself in, as this is the beginning of things getting very confusing. Right, so Armageddon kicks off centuries in the past when the Adanian sorceress Delia foretells the apocalyptic end of all the realms. She has the foresight to see that the cumulative power of all of the realm's various fighters will eventually destabilise it, leading to its ultimate demise. The circumstances of this actually happening though are complicated. You see, Delia's husband King Argus, who's also an elder god by the way, constructs a giant pyramid where the final battle royale for power will eventually take place. This battle royale will be against the elemental man on fire, Blaze, who has been created solely for the purpose of killing the various fighters from across the realms. 
But if anyone but Argus's sons, Taven or Dagon, are to defeat Blaze, it would trigger the apocalypse. You see, complicated. Anyway, Argus puts his two sons on ice in the hopes that they'll be victorious against Blaze and put a stop to Armageddon. Long story short, and it is a long story, Taven and Dagon are awakened in the future and are instructed to fight Blaze by Argus in a bid to replace him as an Elder God. The pyramid pops back up and intrigues the entire population of Mortal Kombat, especially when the top bursts into flames presenting the new challenger of Blaze. And so kicks off the final battle to determine the fate of the realms, and the ultimate champion of Mortal Kombat. Of course, there are multiple endings, with the original ending seen in MK Armageddon now being considered non-canon. In that ending, Taven is victorious against Blaze and takes up his position as an Elder God, a position that he swears to use as a means to prevent the Armageddon. But as we all know, this is not what ultimately takes place. As is revealed in the next canonical entry in the franchise, the 2011 reboot of Mortal Kombat, Armageddon ends with only two fighters left alive, Shao Kahn and Raiden. But before we delve into the fallout of that epic conclusion, it's time for something completely different. I'm so sorry to leave you on a cliffhanger like that, I promise to keep this section really brief. Yet, before we can get into the meat of Armageddon's canonical ending, seen during the intro of 2011's Mortal Kombat, I thought I should explain why the 8th game in the franchise is technically AWOL in the canon. Long story short, the fusion of the Mortal Kombat and DC universes takes place in a timeline bubble all on its own, and has no bearing on the story going forwards. It does, however, take cues from some of the preceding narrative from previous MK games, taking place in a world where Shao Kahn has been defeated. His defeat takes place simultaneously with that of DC villain Darkseid, and as a result the pair fuse into the monstrosity known as Dark Khan. This mad act triggers everyone and everything across the two colliding universes to absolutely lose their minds in a bloody battle royale until only Raiden and Superman are left alive. Ultimately these two do-gooders team up to defeat Dark Khan and bring an end to all this madness. Anyway, as I said, MK vs DC Universe exists all the way out there on its own, in its own little bubble, and will have no more bearing on this timeline going forwards. But I thought it would be weird not to include it. Right, back to the main attraction. Okay, so Mortal Kombat 9, or more simply, just Mortal Kombat, sees Shao Kahn emerge victorious against Blaze, and as a result, he's granted godlike powers. These all-powerful new abilities effectively help him overcome the last living combatant, Raiden, in a fight to the death. But just as Shao Kahn is about to deliver the final blow, killing the God of Thunder, Raiden uses his own Elder God amulet to send a message back in time to his past self, a message simply stating, he must win. And with this simple message, a whole new branch of the timeline is created. You see, Mortal Kombat 2011 is a soft reboot of the franchise of sorts, which retells the events of the original three Mortal Kombat games, but keeps everything within the same continuity. Let me explain. Okay, so the action immediately rewinds back to the events of the very first Mortal Kombat game, to a younger Raiden who suddenly has a premonition of the future along with his future self's message. He zaps back into consciousness and realises that his amulet has been damaged as a result of the visions he's just seen. And so the 2011 reboot largely follows Raiden's journey to discover who exactly the he is of the message he's just received. For starters, he doesn't think much of it, and simply assumes that the message refers to his top Earthrealm lad Liu Kang. So by and large, the events of MK1 play out much as they did before. The original Sub-Zero is murdered by his rival Scorpion, and Liu Kang defeats Goro and Shang Tsung. But as the tourney comes to a close, Raiden notices that his amulet has taken on more damage, which leads him to believe that he hasn't averted the apocalypse. More timeline changes come about in the retelling of the events of the second game though. Firstly, Raiden rescues Smoke from becoming a Lin Kuei cyborg at the expense of the younger Sub-Zero. And secondly, Raiden subs in Liu Kang's best mate Kung Lao to take the prime spot in the Outworld tourney for Earthrealm. Kung Lao is ultimately victorious over Shang Tsung and Quan Chi, but he's killed moments later by a surprise neck snap courtesy of Shao Kahn. Liu Kang flies into a fit of rage and beats the hell out of the Emperor, who has to be nursed back to help by the sorcery of Quan Chi. Anyway, the upshot of all of this is Raiden's amulet becomes even more damaged. That Armageddon is still on the cards, lads. 
With Shao Kahn and Quan Chi forming an alliance, Shao Kahn is able to fast track the revival of his former Queen Sindel, and this opens the door for a full scale invasion of Earthrealm. As a result of this, Raiden and Liu Kang lodge a complaint with the Elder Gods, who duly inform them that there's nothing wrong with the invasion. Unless they try to merge Earthrealm with Outworld without taking the proper action, i.e., a big bloody Mortal Kombat tournament to the death. Anyways, while all of this is happening, Queen Sindel basically slaughters most of the cast of heroes, including Jack, Sub-Zero 2.0, Smoke, and eventually Katana. And then Raiden finally realises that the he of the cryptic messages must refer to Shao Kahn, because if he attempts to invade Earthrealm without winning via Mortal Kombat, the Elder Gods will punish him. Liu Kang doesn't see eye to eye on this notion though, and makes a move to attack the Khan. And while trying to stop him, Raiden accidentally kills him. Whoops. And this mad, timey-wimey narrative comes to a close when a guilt-racked Raiden surrenders to Shao Kahn, only for the Elder Gods to finally intervene, granting Raiden godly superpowers, which he then uses to destroy the Khan for not invading through the requisite bureaucratic means of Mortal Kombat. And so by the end of the 2011 Mortal Kombat, most of the heroes are pretty much dead, and Raiden is left to rebuild with Sonya Blade and Johnny Cage. But there's one last twist in the tale, as Quan Chi is revealed to be working with Shinnok, a la Mortal Kombat 4, and that the destruction of Shao Kahn and the devastation of Earthrealm has all been a part of their grand plan. Right, time to move into uncharted territory for the alternate timeline with Mortal Kombat X, which takes place a few years after the climactic events of the previous game. Shinnok has launched a full-scale invasion of Earthrealm with his army of the undead, many of whom are deceased fighters from the last game. Seeing as there are only a handful of quote-unquote good guys left in the series, it's left largely up to Sonya Blade and Johnny Cage to save the day, and they open up a portal to Raiden's chambers to help the Gods of Wind and Thunder defeat Shinnok's forces. Out of almost nowhere, Johnny Cage awakens hitherto unseen superpowers that allows him to protect Sonya and hold back Shinnok's advances long enough for Raiden to nick his amulet and imprison the gods inside it. They track his partner in crime, Quan Chi, back to the Netherrealm, where they restore a handful of fighters to human form, including Scorpion, Sub-Zero and Jax, and eventually overpower the evil sorcerer. And so for the first time in, like, forever, a shaky peace finally descends across the realms, now that Shao Kahn, Shinnok and Quan Chi are all taken care of. Twenty odd years pass, in which time a lot happens. Johnny and Sonya hook up, have a kid named Cassie and get divorced, Sub-Zero kills Sector and reclaims his place as the head of the Lin Kuei, and Scorpion and Sub-Zero reconcile their never-ending rivalry after Sub-Zero discovers the treachery behind the death of Scorpion's family. Anyway, it's 20 years later and the shit inevitably hits the fan again, when a new generation of fighters, including many of the offspring of franchise mainstays including Cassie Cage, Jax's daughter Jackie and Kung Lao's nephew Kung Jin, get embroiled in a civil war on Outworld. There they discover treachery at the hands of its new ruler, a lad named Kotal Khan, and his second in command, the insectoid warrior Devorah, the latter of which is actually a double agent working for Quan Chi. In all the ensuing chaos, Devorah manages to get her hands on Shinnok's amulet, and so the plot becomes all about our good hero's attempts to stop Quan Chi and Devorah from resurrecting Shinnok, a feat that despite Quan Chi's grisly death, they ultimately fail at. Shinnok then launches another invasion of Earthrealm, albeit one that's actually successful, and he makes his way into the Jinsei chamber, the core of Earthrealm's life force, and corrupts it, which turns him into a great hulking demon god thing. Long story short, it's Cassie that ultimately saves the day, when she triggers similar superhuman powers to those her father showcased earlier in the game. She uses these newfound abilities to defeat Shinnok, which paves the way for Raiden to purify Earthrealm's Jinsei life force and strip the demon of all his power. The upshot of this is that the Netherrealm has new people in charge, the undead revenants of Liu Kang and Katano. And so Mortal Kombat X comes to a close with a corrupted Raiden in possession of Shinnok's amulet visiting the Netherrealm to give a warning to the new rulers, that they will face fates worse than death if they ever invade Earthrealm. Now, if you thought any of the previous timeline-altering narratives were confusing, get ready for your head to explode with the next entry in the chronology, Mortal Kombat 11. 
Okay, with a corrupted Dark Raid and hell bent on protecting Earthrealm at all costs, he enacts a plan to destroy all of its rivals, and he kickstarts this ungodly plan by decapitating Shinnok. This act of violence naturally does not go down well with Shinnok's dear mother, a lass named Kronika, who is literally the keeper of all time, and she vows to take revenge by erasing Raiden from all timelines. And so begins a mad game, which basically reveals multiple timelines within the Mortal Kombat universe, which basically makes this chalkboard useless. Kronika starts her machinations by forming an alliance with the undead revenants of Liu Kang and Kintano, before opening up a time storm to bring pretty much everything I've mentioned up to this point into disarray. For starters, this time storm brings with it younger versions of several key players from throughout the franchise, including Raiden, Liu Kang, Katana, Johnny Cage, Jax, Scorpion and Kung Lao, while also erasing Dark Raiden from the current timeline. And so starts all the brain warping time antics, as characters, both past and present versions, come into contact with one another in various ways. Liu Kang, Kung Lao and Raiden broker a shaky truce with Kotal Kahn's outworld before Raiden visits the Elder Gods to see if there's anything they can do to intervene in Kronika's timeline destroying antics. The short answer is no, as the Time Storm is draining their reserves of power. The longer answer is that Shinnok's never before seen twin sister Cetrion has the answer to how to defeat her mother Kronika, a MacGuffin known as the Crown of Souls. But unsurprisingly, that answer is tinged with betrayal, as Cetrion slaughters the Elder Gods and escapes to search for the crown herself. Raiden anticipates this and sends out a squad of fighters to retrieve the crown first, and they run into Cetrion at Shang Tsung's abandoned island base, where she eventually escapes with the crown. Naturally, this all leads to an inevitable big climactic battle. Kronika kidnaps the younger version of Liu Kang and assimilates him with his present undead Revenant version. But this evil plan is all in vain as Raiden follows in pursuit and eventually merges himself with Liu Kang to become the all-powerful fire god Liu Kang. The combined heroes of Outworld and Earthrealm take the fight to Kronika and the newly minted god Liu Kang defeats Cetrion. But as Kronika is literally in control of time, she rewinds events and absorbs her daughter Cetrion's power, which gives her enough time essence to rewind all the way back to the literal beginning of the entire universe, which basically erases everything from this timeline video thus far. Yet due to his new godly status, Liu Kang is immune to these time travelling antics, and so he enters the endgame of Mortal Kombat 11 unscathed. Naturally, there are several possible outcomes to the ending, all of which I guess can technically be considered canon, as this game introduces multiple timelines. Firstly, if Kronika wins, she murders Liu Kang, which sets up a whole new separate timeline. Secondly, if Liu Kang wins outright, he creates a new timeline alongside Katana. But the canonical ending though is Liu Kang's victory, albeit with the god losing one round of the fight to Kronika. This eventually leads to him meeting with a mortal version of Raiden, who becomes his advisor and this sets the stage for the next chapter in the MK universe, the DLC story expansion Aftermath. Right, here we are, the final swan song for the alternate timeline created at the beginning of Mortal Kombat 2011, and you can bet your clocks things are going to get even more complicated. Ok, I'm already frazzled with this timeline, but I'll try my best with this one. So following the near apocalyptic ending of Mortal Kombat 11, Aftermath kicks off right away with Raiden and the fire god Liu Kang attempting to fix history. But unbeknownst to them, Shang Tsung, Fujin and the Earthrealm shaman Nightwolf are also still alive, having been trapped in some sort of time immune prison or something to that effect. Shang Tsung, the scheming bastard, convinces Liu Kang to send the trio back into the time storm to steal the crown of souls before Kronika gets her hands on it, a la the events of MK11. Raiden is suspicious but Liu Kang goes through with this mad idea and off the lads go into the time warp. Inevitably, Shang Tsung has nefarious intentions, mainly involving resurrecting a fully powered up Sindel to use against the might of Cetrion in order to reclaim the crown. Long story short, the scheming sorcerer gets his mitts on the crown and is able to harness the time powers of Kronika. En route, he hoovers up souls left, right and centre, before defeating the Keeper of Time herself and erasing her from existence. And in his last moment of glory, as he reaches the hourglass of time, Fire God Liu Kang comes a-knocking. 
It turns out that Liu Kang has been aware of Shang Tsung's intentions all along, and has actually allowed him to gain the crown as he believed the sorcerer to be the only one capable of eliminating Kronika. And so the final, final fight of Mortal Kombat kicks off in earnest, Liu Kang versus Shang Tsung, just like the original final duel all the way back in the very first game. There are two outcomes, one of which is canonical and which leads to Mortal Kombat 1. Simply put, if Shang Tsung wins, he slaughters Liu Kang and uses the hourglass to conquer all the known realms. Whereas in the canonical ending, Liu Kang wins and erases Shang Tsung from existence. With the power of the crown and the hourglass, Liu Kang effectively starts over with his own new timeline, that's dubbed the New Era. And he kicks this new timeline off by visiting his good pal Kung Lao's ancient ancestor to become his new champion in an upcoming Mortal Kombat tournament. Speaking of which... Yep, all of this leads to the upcoming Mortal Kombat 1, which basically reboots the franchise again. As Liu Kang's primary goal is to establish a more peaceful timeline, many of the key players from across the franchise get new rebooted roles. For example, Sub-Zero and Scorpion are now brothers, both fighting within the Lin Kuei clan of assassin warriors. Naturally, there is still some tension between the pair, but now it's born out of their position and status within their clan. Speaking of siblings, Katana and Melina are now biological sisters, albeit with Melina still infected with the Tarkat disease that gives her that iconic snarling mouth. And then there's Raiden and Kung Lao, who are now living humble lives as farmers, albeit farmers that could beat the living shit out of you if you look at their flock wrong. Interestingly, Raiden is no longer the God of Thunder, so it appears that the power dynamic has shifted between Raiden and Liu Kang, with the latter taking on the mantle of the godly mentor. Aside from all these rebooted roles and peaceful pretenses, there's still plenty of carnage in this new iteration of MK, not least from Shang Tsung, who appears to arrive through a portal, potentially from some other timeline or dimension, who knows. And then there are whisperings of a mysterious new enemy that Liu Kang states never could have been anticipated so we'll have to wait and see just who that is when the game finally launches. And there you have it, the Mortal Kombat timeline explained to the best of my ability. This one nearly melted me as much as Metal Gear Solid, so I hope you enjoyed this breakdown. And if you enjoy these kinds of gaming timelines, make sure to subscribe to GameSpot as we've got plenty more on the channel. Thanks a lot for watching guys, I'll see you next time.